And I think we've wrapped it up. So hello. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon or good evening or wherever the heck you might be. And uh, hello, Wouter. And thank you. Uh, well, I don't think congratulations are due to me personally, but um, I'm I'm happy you're happy. <laughs> I'm happy. Um, hello, Ilva. Yes, I am glad for the same things you are. And Holger, same thing. Uh, so lovely to see you all. Who else is here? Whoa, gosh, there's a whole lot of folks there. Okay, so I've got to go back a little bit, and I'm going to say hello to some folks. So hello, Maria Jose. Hello, Cliff. Hello, Suzanne. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, Chris. Hi, Ronnie. Hi, Petra. Hello, Christine or Christina, depending on if you're going with a more German pronunciation or not. Um, and Stuart, who is like unto a Norse god today, and Carol and Brandon. So hello, everybody. Yes, it's lovely to see you all and lovely to be here with you. Um, going to start a new book today, and I'll get to that in um, just a moment. I'm not going to talk particularly. I'm not going to get into stuff about the election and all that. I, I think everybody knows how I feel and uh, that, uh, but it's also, there's lots of other places that you can go these days on the intertubes to find political conversations and conversations about the election. So, um, although of course, me being me and me having the, the political leanings that I do, I am extremely relieved that we are not going to have to have that crazy person um, in, uh, in a position of power after January. Um, that said, that's all I'm going to say about it. But uh, yeah, some, some serious relief here and some serious gratitude to a lot of hardworking people in a lot of states who went out and worked and worked and worked, um, especially, oh my God, a whole lot of uh, voters who were, um, you know, traditionally left out of the loops or actively were discriminated against in their attempts to vote and all kinds of things. So those people have gone out anyway, sometimes standing in very long lines. Um, and truthfully, Honestly, whoever you voted for, uh, I'm, I'm glad for those people who went out and voted because that is a big, important thing. You know, it still is. Um, and whether we are, are what we aim to be yet in this country and in other countries that might be listening in tonight, um, we can't get there without democracy and fairness and uh, a modicum of, of uh concern for other people. So I'm very glad about that. So Hazel, hello, Hazel. Good morning. Um, that is my beautiful mother-in-law checking in. Angie, hello, Angie. And Jim, and I think I already said hello, Brandon, but if I didn't, I'll say hello again. Anyway, yes, I did already say hello. So good. Okay. Uh, lovely to have you all here with me. We are all um, in much the same situation that we've been in, uh, pandemic lockdown, bored, cabin fevery, itchy, crazy, ah, you know, all that stuff. But most of you out there know it in one shape or form. Um, and uh, unless you're watching from New Zealand, in which case things have gone a little better, in part because of having a government that actually paid attention and did their best to deal with it from the beginning. Um, so that's all real good. And um, I want to uh, tell you, we're all fine here still. Um, my dad is, is recovering. I just talked to him yesterday or today. Anyway, what, what recently um, he's in rehab. He's, he's doing better. He sounded well. So, um, you know, my parents are both still with me for which I am incredibly grateful, but they're both needless to say, I mean, I'm old. So obviously my parents are, are older. Um, so uh, anything like this is always scary, as many of you know out there. Um, and uh, so I'm happy about that. And thank you for all the kind words that uh, many of you sent. And um, anything else that I've got to talk about in particular? Nah, we're still in the same situation here. So however, since I am about to start, I should tell you what I'm going to do. And this again, for those of you who can't watch both things live, uh, both the nighttime or early morning 
uh, gig here, California time, which is 2 o'clock, it's 2.05 in the morning now, and uh, then the 7 p.m. Sunday time slot. Um, for those of you who cannot make both of those, um, I suggest if you want to follow the story, I'm going to do again, alternating um, reading and you know, changing each time instead of uh, reading separate things to people because I'm reading a whole novel this time. For a variety of reasons, uh, somebody, one of my friends online, uh, Nancy, said, uh, are you going to read Shadow March? And I went, four long volumes, I'm not quite prepared. This is already going to be the longest thing I've read, but what I'm going to read is War of the Flowers. Um, Das Blumenkrieg in German, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, hey, there it is. Lovely foil cover. Um, very, very lovely Michael Whalen painting. And uh, before I start, I have a couple of things to explain, although one of them won't really feature tonight. Um, and uh, at the beginning of the book, there is a, well, I'll just read it. Okay, so this is War of the Flowers. Oh, a quick aside on War of the Flowers. I actually wrote this novel while I was doing the first Shadow March book as an online exercise, I guess. We, we had an inkling, I had an inkling, that we weren't going to make any money and might in fact lose money doing an online serial novel for subscription because it was kind of an unusual thing and I think it worked for Stephen King, but I'm not quite as well known as Steve. So. Um, one of the things that uh, I did, as I said to myself, if I don't want my family to have to go live with me um, under the underpass on the freeway and sleep under a plastic tarp, um, which a lot of people have to, <laughs> you know, I'm not saying like, so I, you know, I'm better than that. Hell no. You know, the stuff can happen to anybody. But anyway, at the time, back in 2000, I said, I better write another book at the same time, just so I have something in the pipeline because this is what happens when you're a working writer and you're not a rich working writer. I mean, you know, the people who've made tons of money, J.K. Rowling, Stephen King, Jim Patterson, or James Patterson, whatever his name is, you know, they could take years off. Don't work that way for most of us writers. Even those of us who are fortunate enough to be able to write for a living, uh, you still got to have stuff in the pipeline. You got to have stuff out. And it also makes a difference career-wise because the new books tend to bring attention to your older books as well. So some night I'll, I'll answer questions about the life of a professional writer if anybody's interested. Because um, that's one of the few things that I'm actually more than usually knowledgeable about. Um, the, the general thing with us writers, as I always say, is we're a mile wide and an inch deep. We know a little bit about a lot of things. Anyway, so I started writing what were the flowers in 2000 while we were prep, uh, prepping and starting the uh, Shadow March project, which I think went online in like June of 2001, finally. And that's when I was writing the book. So, um, but it's one of the few books I've ever based on a dream that I had. Um, and I had a dream a uh, long time back, back in my 20s, early 30s about a bunch of uh, commuters waiting for a train, except they all had bat wings. They were very normally dressed, kind of boring business guy, gray flannel suits, but they had bat wings. And I woke up from this dream and I actually did a sketch based on it. Um, and for some reason, it just stuck in my mind. And it was an image that I liked. And then later on, um, I started linking it to another idea I had had, which was uh, kind of pseudo autobiographical because I didn't, I, I still don't, I don't know my biological father. I know his name. I know where he was <laughs> before I was born, but after that, it's a mystery. Long story, not all that interesting to follow up on because I have a stepdad who, you know, has always been my dad. But because of that, that whole idea of having an unknown father is a very big fantasy trope. So that may be one of the reasons I'm a fantasy writer. But so it started me thinking about it and then that and the commuters and I started thinking about, you know, how could these things fit together? Anyway, eventually it became War of the Flowers. Before 
I wrote Bobby Dollar, the Bobby Dollar books. Um, the character Theo in this book is um, kind of the closest thing to a semi-autobiographical character. He's not me. He's me maybe if my life had gone a much different direction. But as an indicator of that or as a kind of an inside joke, um, people often thought my name might be obviously short, Tad, short for Thaddeus or even Theodore. Um, so this character's name is Theo and his last name is Vilnosh, which is another version of William. Um, so anyway, although he's American, so he says Theo Vilmos, but, uh, you know, it's originally Eastern European. Um, anyway, so this is in some ways kind of the closest I came before Bobby Dollar to writing autobiographical characters. Bobby Dollar is not autobiographical, but he literally talks the way I think. So that's the difference. Um, anyway, um, so that's where we're at. And here I'm going to read you a quick thing from the beginning of it. And then I'm going to give you the other war. Actually, there's three, three consumer warnings before I start this novel. And I better get on them. So um, first one is an author's note. And it says, readers may notice a certain uncomfortable resonance in parts of this book to events around the terrorist attacks on New York and Washington, D.C. of September 11, 2001. Remember, this was book came out in, when was it published? It was published in like 19, I mean, 2003. Uh, but it was basically came out in 2002. So it was very quickly after that. Um, anyway, sorry, I'm flipping back and forth. Um, the part of the story that most closely parallels things that happened on that horrible day was actually part of the planned book since the beginning while preparing to write this note, I found it mentioned prominently in an outline written in January of 2000. I have modified those sections slightly so that they echo the real events a little less closely, but it was too central an event in the story to take out entirely. And then this is more for people who are still very traumatized at the time. I hope anyone disturbed by the similarity will accept my apology for discomfort caused and understand that this was a case of leaving in something already planned and important to the story rather than adding something after the fact to try and gain some cheap thrills out of a tragedy that was international in scope but also personal for very many people. Okay, so that's my first disclaimer, but you know, that's an old disclaimer now and I doubt there's quite so many people around who are still quite so triggered or, or uh, otherwise traumatized by 2001, by 9-11. Um, and it's not till way late in the book anyway, so you won't even have to worry about that tonight if by chance it is an issue for you. However, if you have phobias and terrors relating to problems with pregnancies, that I probably will get to tonight. So I will warn you that in, of that in advance. That is my trigger warning. Um, as far as tonight's reading goes, there are some pregnancy issues. So just mentioning that in case you would like to be informed. The third trigger warning is for everybody out there who it knows what a proper Irish accent sounds like. There's one of the characters, again, who's not going to appear this early in the story, but is a pretty pivotal, important character, um, is, is asked at one point why she sounds like she's Irish. She's actually a fairy. Um, and she basically tells the person who asked her, we don't sound like the Irish. The Irish sound like us. So there may be some excuse I can make that I'm actually, when I get to that part, I'm going to be doing not an Irish dialect, but a fairy dialect. Um, and you'll maybe excuse me for it. But that said, um, if I could, I would avoid reading the character's voice in a bad Irish dialect. Um, the problem is, is that I wrote it with my own bad Irish dialect in my head. I hear it every time. I don't think I could say these char this character's lines without some version of a admittedly probably awful mixed up between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland dialect. And God, I'm sure it'll be horrible. And anybody who's actually Irish or knows Irish people out there will be quivering in their seats and wanting to reach through the screen and strike me. Um, 
sadly, you can't. <laughs> That's one of the benefits of an online presence, at least for me, not for you. Um, and I apologize, but I just can't read it any other way because that's how I wrote it. That's what I was thinking. So you'll have to bear with me. Anyway, so this is The War of the Flowers, originally published in 2003, written to keep uh, my family out of the poorhouse while we were doing the first Shadow March experiment, writing the first Shadow March novel as an online serial. Um, and I made a joke today somewhere about we're still paying for it. I'm not certain if that's 100% true, but we certainly didn't, didn't, didn't even break even on it. So it was an interesting experiment. I'm glad I did it, and it led me to um, the Shadow March message board, which became a place for a lot of friendship and a lot of cool things happening. And then later on, um, it uh, morphed into the tadwilliams.com message board to which I invite all of you who want to find some nice people to hang with. Anyway, okay, so now I'm starting with the prologue of The War of the Flowers. A single flower, a hellebore, stood in a vase of volcanic glass in the middle of the huge desk, glowing almost radioactively white in the pool of a small artful spotlight. In other great houses, the image of such a deceptively fragile looking bloom would have been embroidered on a banner covering most of the wall behind the seat of power. But there was no need for such things here. No one could reach the innermost chambers of this monstrous bone-colored building and not know where they were and who ruled in this place. In the mortal world, the hellebore is sometimes called the Christmas rose because of an old tale that says it sprouted where a little girl who had no gift for the Christ child wept into the snow outside the stable in Bethlehem. Both snow and the flower itself were unlikely to have been found in the Holy Land in those days, but that has never hurt the story's popularity. In Greece of the old myths, Melampus of Pylos used hellebore to save the daughters of the king of Argos from a Dionysian madness that had set them running naked through the city, weeping and screaming and laughing. There are many stories about hellebore. Most of them have tears in them. The remover of inconvenient obstacles was no stranger to silence. In fact, he swam in it like a fish. He stared at the spotlit flower, letting his thoughts wander down some of the darker tracks of his labyrinthine mind and waited, patient as stone, for the figure behind the desk to speak. The pause was a long one. The person on the other side of the desk, who had apparently been pursuing some internal quarry of his own, stirred at last. Slowly, almost lazily, he extended an arm to touch the flower. His spider silk suit whispered so faintly only a bat, or the creature sitting across from him, could hear. His long finger, only a little less white than the flower, touched a petal and made it quiver. There were no windows here in the heart of the building, but the remover of inconvenient obstacles knew that it was raining hard outside, the drops spattering and hissing on the pavement, coach tires spitting, here, the air was as still as if he and his host sat inside a velvet-lined jewel casket. The shape in the beautiful shimmering blue-black suit gently prodded the flower again. War is coming, he said at last. His voice was deep and musical. Mortal women, who had only heard him speak, waking to discover him warm and invisible in their rooms in the middle of the night, had fallen so deeply in love with that voice that they had forsworn all human suitors, giving up the chance of sunlit happiness forever in the futile hope he would return to them, would let them live again that one delirious midnight hour. War is coming, agreed the remover. The child of whom we spoke before, it must not live. A long breath. Was it a sigh? It will not. You will receive the usual fee. The remover nodded, distracted by his own thoughts. 
he had very little fear that anyone, even this most powerful personage, would neglect to pay him. With war coming, they would need him again. He was the specialist of specialists, totally discreet and terrifyingly effective. He also made a very bad enemy. Now, he asked, as soon as you can. If you wait too long, someone might notice. Also, we don't want the risk. The clover effect is still not perfectly understood. You might not get a second chance. The remover stood. I have never yet needed such a thing. He was gone from the inner room so quickly he might have been a shadow flitting across the dark walls. The master of the house of Hellebore could see much that others could not, but even he had trouble marking the exact progress of the remover's self-deletion. It would not be good to have to guard against that one, he thought to himself. He must be kept sweet, or he must become ashes in the well of forgetting. Either way, he must never again work for one of the other houses. The master of the house stroked the pale flower on his desk again, considering. Another curiosity of the hellebore is that its bloom can be frozen solid in the deepest winter snows, but when the ice melts away, dripping from the petals like tears, the flower beneath is still alive, still supple. Hellebore is strong and patient. The tall, lean figure in the spider silk suit pressed a button on the side of his desk and spoke into the air. The winds of fairy carried his words to all those who needed to hear them throughout the great city and all across the troubled land, summoning his allies and tributaries to the first council of the next War of the Flowers. Part One. Good night, nobody. Chapter One, Clouds. Theo felt a small flutter of guilt as he turned the cell phone back on, especially when he noticed he'd left it off for more than two hours and was relieved to see that there were no messages. He'd only meant to flick it off for a few minutes just to make sure there were no interruptions while they were tuning. The young guys, especially Chris, the guitarist, got really pissy about that. But things had started happening, and he'd forgotten. Johnny stepped over the guitar cases spread across the living room rug like discarded cocoons and slid open the door to join him outside. The fog had come down the hill while they had been practicing. The fenced patio seemed an island in a cold, misty sea. Jesus, San Francisco in March. He should have brought his jacket. Might as well be in Minnesota. Hey! He asked Johnny, got a smoke? The drummer made a face and patted his shirt pocket, then his pants pocket. He was small, but he had long, strong arms. With his paunch and his shaggy but balding head, the chest hair climbing out of his t-shirt collars, he always made Theo think of the soulful chimpanzees in that English woman's documentaries. When Johnny found the pack at last, he shook out one for Theo, then one for himself, and lit it. Man, you never have your own never buy any. I only smoke when I'm playing. Johnny shook his head. That's so typical, Vilmos. You always get the easy road. I'm an addict. You only smoke when you want to, like when you're around me. I'll probably be the one who gets cancer, too. Probably. Theo considered calling home, but he was going to be leaving in a few minutes anyway. Still, Cat was very deep into, I'm pregnant and I want to know where you are mode. He felt another ripple of guilt and couldn't decide what to do. He stared at the phone as perplexed as if it were an artifact of a vanished civilization. Your old lady leave a message? Johnny was the only one in the band who was Theo's age, but he talked like he was even older, unashamedly using words like chicks and hip. Theo had actually heard him say out of sight once but he had sworn later he was being ironic. Johnny was also the only one who'd even understand something as archaic as phoning home. Chris and Dano and Morgan were in that early 20s stage where they just 
paged their girlfriends to announce when they were dropping by after practice to have sex. Nah, I gotta get going anyway. Johnny flipped his cigarette over the fence and out into the street, a tiny shooting star. Just listen to the playback on Feast first. You don't want Chris's asshole to get any more puckered than it already is, do you? He smiled deep in his beard and started peeling off the athletic tape he wrapped around his knuckles before playing, because he bashed them against the rim so hard. Theo thought he'd rather have scars than the pink, hairless patches that striped Johnny's hairy hands. But Johnny was a seemingly permanent, permanently single guy who hadn't had a date in months, so he didn't worry much about things like that. Theo did. He was seriously considering whether it was time to cut his moderately long brown hair. It was bad enough to have turned 30 and still be singing in garage bands without looking like an aging stoner, too. As it turned out, Theo spent at least another half an hour listening to the demo tracks they had recorded for Feast of Fools, a sort of high goth pro processional that Chris had written, and over which the guitarist fussed like a neurotic chef preparing for an important dinner party. He had more than a few irritating things to say about Theo's vocal, wanting more rasp in it, more of an air of menace, the kind of melodrama that Theo didn't like much. On their last listen, as Chris bobbed his close-cropped head to his own music, his expression oddly combining pleasure and pain, Theo had a sudden flash of insight. He's going to want to do the vocal on this himself. That's where this is going. And even though I'm a hundred times better eventually, he's going to get his confidence and want to do all the lead vocals himself. And that'll be it for me with this band. He wasn't certain how he felt about that. On the one hand, much as he admired the young guys playing and Chris Roll's musical ideas, it wasn't anything like his ideal band. For a start, he hated the name, the mighty clouds of angst. It was clumsy. Worse, it was a joke name playing off a famous gospel group, the mighty clouds of joy. Theo believed firmly that joke names equaled joke bands, the Beatles notwithstanding. Plus, it just irritated him. Chris, Morgan, and Dana weren't even old enough to remember the mighty clouds of joy, so why pick that as a name to parody? It smacked a little of white suburban boys making fun of earnest religious black people, and that made Theo uncomfortable. But if he ever mentioned it, he knew they'd just show him that fish-like stare they had perfected, the all-purpose defense against hopelessly uncool parents and teachers, and he would feel even older than he did. So, when did I wind up on the wrong side of that particular line? He eased on his ancient leather jacket and bummed another smoke off John for the road, or for home, rather, since it was pretty hard to smoke while wearing a motorcycle helmet. He looked around, feeling like he was leaving something behind. Lead singers didn't carry much in the way of equipment. The mics and PA belonged to Morgan and Chris. Theo could walk away from the clouds as easily as he was strolling out the door tonight. If he was good at anything, it was leaving when things got too weird. If he did get forced out, would Johnny quit too? Theo wasn't sure how he felt about that. This was the third band he'd played in with Johnny Battistini, following the obligatory should-have-made-it-big disaster in which they'd met and the horrible cover band in which they'd marked time until hooking up with Chris and company. Theo wouldn't mind the downtime of looking for another gig, and God knew Catherine would be happy to have him home some nights, especially with the baby coming. But old Johnny B. didn't have a whole lot else going on in his life. Besides his record store job and the clouds, in fact, Johnny was pretty much the kind of guy advertisers made fun of, but who kept their clients in business. An amiable lump who lived on takeout food, rented porn movies in bunches, and watched wrestling by himself. Chris looked up from yet another playing of Feast of Fools as Theo reached the door. You going? He sounded irritated. Chris had gray eyes like a sky before a storm, the kind of eyes in which teenage girls probably saw things that weren't really there at all. No, Theo wanted to say. No, I'm going to hang around here and stay up all night smoking dope and marveling at my own brilliance, just like you guys, because I've got nothing better to do. Nobody on my ass about when I come home. 
Can't stay, he said instead. I got a pregnant girlfriend, remember? And for a self-righteous moment, he almost forgot he had left the phone off for two hours. Chris rolled his eyes, dismissing the entire unimaginably boring subject, then pushed the buttons on the DAT deck with his long fingers, rewinding the tape to listen to his feedback-heavy solo again. Morgan and Dano bobbed their heads once each in Theo's direction, which he assumed was to save the energy of waving. John smiled at him, sharing the joke, although, unlike Theo, he was going to stay and hang out with these kids a decade younger than himself sharing bong hits and loose talk about a hypothetical first album until one or two in the morning. Stay loose, Thee, he called. Theo's ancient Yamaha started on the first kick. It seemed like a good sign. The bedroom light was out, but the television was flickering behind the blinds, which meant Catherine was probably still up. Even though she hadn't tried to call him, he had a feeling she wouldn't be too happy with him coming in after midnight. Theo hesitated, then sat down on the porch steps to smoke the cigarette Johnny had given him. The street lamps made little pools of light down the sidewalk that ran in front of the dark houses. It was a quiet neighborhood in the western edition, a working neighborhood, full of people who watched Letterman or Leno through the opening monologue and then switched off because they had to be up early. A wind sent leaves rattling and rolling up the street. I'm dying here, he thought suddenly. I don't belong here. He had surprised himself. If not here, then where? What was he going to find that was any better? It was true that he never felt quite alive except when he was singing, making music. He often had the disturbing feeling that in his job, his conversations, even sometimes being with Cat, he was just going through the motions. But he felt sure he was past the childish dreams of being a rock star. He would be happy just to play club dates in front of live human beings every few weeks. No, this was what he wanted, wasn't it? A house? A grown-up life? It was certainly what Catherine Lillard wanted, and he wanted her. He'd been with her for almost two years. That was nearly forever, wasn't it? Practically married even before they'd received the test results. Theo walked across the tiny lawn to the sidewalk and flicked his cigarette into the gutter, then went inside. The television was on, but there was only a tangled blanket in Cat's usual curling up spot on the couch. Hey, honey? Cat? The kitchen was dark, but it smelled like she'd been cooking. There was a weird, spicy scent in the air, something both sweet and a little sickening. The windows were open, and it was a nice March night, but the air inside the small house felt as close as if a thunderstorm were moving in. Cat? It's me! He shrugged. Maybe she'd gone to bed and left the television on. He wandered down the hall and saw that the light was on in the bathroom, but that was nothing unusual. Cat hated fumbling for the switch when she was half awake or barking her shin in the dark on something left in the hall. He took little notice of the bundle on the floor against the far bathroom wall. It was the red smears on the side of the tub that caught his eye instead, weirdly vivid against the porcelain. He pushed the door all the way open. It took perhaps two full seconds to realize what he was seeing the longest two seconds he had ever experienced, a sideways lurch of reality as disorienting as a hallucination. Blood was smeared across the bathroom floor behind the door, too, screamingly scarlet under the fluorescence. Cat's terry cloth back bathrobe, rolled somehow into a huge lump and flung against the wall near the toilet, was soaked in it as well. Oh my God, he said. The bathrobe shuddered and rolled over, revealing Catherine's pale face. Her skin was like a white paper mask, except for the bloody fingerprints on both cheeks, her own, as he found out later. But for a moment he could only stare, his chest clamped in crushing shock, his brain shrilling, murder, 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 over and over. He was right, but he didn't find that out until later either, much later.
Cat's eyes found his face, struggled to focus. A parched whisper. Theo? My God. My God, what happened? Are, are you... Her throat convulsed so powerfully he thought she was going to vomit. He had a terrible image of blood gushing out of her mouth like a fountain. The ragged sound that leaped from her instead was so horribly raw and ragged that he could not at first understand the words. I lost it! I lost it! I lost it! I lost it! He was down on his knees in the sopping, sopping finger-painted mess of the bathroom floor, the slick, sticky scarlet. Where had it all come from, all this red wetness? He was trying to help her up, panicking, an idiot voice telling him, don't move her, she's an accident victim. But he didn't know what had happened. What could possibly have happened? Did someone get in? And suddenly he understood. I lost it, she moaned, more clear now that there was almost no air left in the cry. Oh, Jesus, I lost. I lost the baby. He was halfway across the house to the phone when he realized his own cell phone was in his pocket. He called 911 and gave them the address while simultaneously trying to wrap towels around the outside of her bathrobe as though she were some immense wound that needed to be held together. She was crying, but it made almost no sound. When he had finished, he held her tightly against him, waiting to hear the sound of the paramedics at the door. Where were you? Her eyes were shut and she was shivering. Where were you? Hospitals were like T.S. Eliot poems somehow. Well-lit wastelands, places of quiet talk that could not quite hide the terrible things going on behind the doors. Even when he went out to the lobby to stretch his legs, to walk off some of the horrible, helpless tension, he felt like he was pacing through a mausoleum. Cat's blood loss had not been as mortal as Theo had felt it must be. Some of the mess had been amniotic fluid and splashed water from the hot bath she had taken when the cramps first started becoming painful. The doctors talked calmly to him of premature rupture of membranes, of possible uterine abnormalities, but it might have been Byzantine religious ritual for all his polaxed brain could make of it. Catherine Lillard slept most of the first ten hours, face pale as a picture book princess, IVs jacked into both arms. When she opened her eyes at last, she seemed like a stranger. Honey, I'm so sorry, he said. It, it wasn't your fault. These things happen. She did not even waste her strength responding to such vacuities. She turned her face away and stared toward the dark television screen angled out from the wall. He went through Kat's phone book. Her mother was there by breakfast, unhappy that Theo hadn't called earlier. Her best friend Lainey showed up just after. Both women wore jeans and work shirts as though they were planning to roll up their sleeves and cook a church dinner or help build a barn. They seemed to draw a sort of curtain around his pale, silent girlfriend, an exclusionary barrier Theo could not cross. After an hour of manufacturing errands for himself, fetching coffee and magazines from downstairs, he told Catherine that he was going to go home and try to get a little sleep. Cat didn't say anything, but her mother agreed that was probably a good idea. He was only able to sleep three hours, tired as he was. When he got up, he realized he hadn't called anyone in his own circle of friends and family. It was hard to imagine who to call. Johnny? Theo knew what his friend's response would be, could even imagine the exact tone. Oh, see, wow, oh, that's such a bummer, man. He would run out of things to say in moments, and then the inadequate die guy talk would hang. He would run out of things to say in moments, and then the inadequate guy talk would hang, lame and awkward. Johnny would be sincere in his sorrow, of course. He, he really was a good guy, but calling him just seemed so pointless. 
And the idea of telling any of the other guys in the band was ludicrous. In fact, he needed to pass the news to Johnny at some point just so the drummer would do that for him so that Theo didn't have to watch Chris and the other two pretend like they gave a shit if they even bothered. Who else should he call? How could you lose a baby? His baby, too, he had to keep reminding himself. Half his, not just Catherine's, and not tell anyone. Had it really come down to this, 30 years old, and nobody in his life who he needed or wanted to talk to about the miscarriage? Where are my friends? I used to have people around me all the time. But who were they, those people? It had seemed exciting at the time, the girls who had flocked to his gigs, the guys who had wanted to manage him, but now he could hardly remember any of them. Friends? No, just people. And people didn't seem as interested in him these days. He wound up calling his mother, although he hadn't spoken to her since just after the beginning of February. It seemed unfair to wait four weeks or so and then call up to deliver this sort of news, but he didn't know what else to do. She answered before the second ring, as usual. It was unnerving the way she always did that, as though she was never out of arm's reach of the phone. Surely her life wasn't that empty since Dad had died. It wasn't like the two of them had been party monsters or anything in the first place. Hi, Mom. Hello, Theo. Nothing else. No, it's been a long time. Or how are you? I just, I got some bad news, Mom. Catherine lost the baby. The pause was long, even by Anna Vilma's standards. That's very sad, Theo. I'm, I'm sorry to hear it. She had a miscarriage. I, I came home and found her on the bathroom, bathroom floor. It, it was pretty awful. Blood everywhere. He realized he was telling it already like a story, not like something that had really happened to him. She's okay, but I, I think she's pretty depressed. What was the cause, Theo? They must know. They. Mom always talked about the people in power, any kind of power, as if they were a single, all-knowing, all-powerful group. No, no, actually they don't. It was just kind of, kind of a spontaneous thing. They're, they're doing tests, but they don't know yet. So sad. And that seemed to be the end of the conversation. Theo, Theo tried to recall what he'd thought when he called, what he had expected, if it had been anything more than a sort of filial duty. Look, Mom, here's what's gone wrong in my life this month. It would have been a real baby, he thought suddenly. As real as me, as, as real as you, Mom, it's not just a so sad. But he didn't say it. Your Uncle Harold is going to be in town next month. His father's younger brother was a retail executive who lived in Southern California. He had taken on himself the role of family patriarch when Theo's dad died, which meant that he called Theo's mom on Christmas Eve and once or twice a year when he flew up to San Francisco on some other business, he took her out to dinner at the Sizzler. He would like to see you. Yeah, well, I'll call you about that. Maybe we can set something up how quickly it had turned into the kind of interaction they always had, dry, faintly guilt-ridden. Theo wanted to say something different, wanted to stop the whole thing and ask her what she really felt. No, what he was supposed to feel about the terrible thing that had happened to him. But it was useless. It was as though they had to force their words across some medium less rich than normal air so that only the simplest, most mundane things could pass from side to side without disappearing into the empty stillness. A quick and unclinging goodbye from his mother, and Theo was alone with himself again. He called the hospital, wondering if Catherine was by herself and needed company. Laney picked up the phone and told him in a fairly cool manner that Cat was sleeping, that he didn't need to hurry off, hurry over. I took the day off work tomorrow, too, she said. I'll be here. 
sounded more like a threat to him than a favor to Cat. How is she? How do you think? Hey, Jesus, Laney, you're acting like I pushed her down the stairs or something. This was my child, too. I know that, Theo. Don't you think I wish I was there when it happened? But I, I still couldn't have done anything about it. The doctor said so. Nobody's blaming you, Theo. But it sure didn't sound like that. He stood in the living room after he had hung up, staring at the clutter untouched since the night before, the residue of normal lives suddenly interrupted by disaster and entombed like Pompeii. She had been sitting just there, watching television when the really bad cramps came. She had bumped the table getting up. A glass was still lying on the floor, a ghost stain, a spilled diet cola visible on the shaggy, seen better days carpet. Was there blood before she reached the bathroom? He started to follow her track, then caught himself. It was too sick, too horrible, like examining a murder scene. Only three hours of sleep, but he was buzzing like he was full of bad speed. He turned the television on. The images were meaningless. Where did my life go? How could something so small, it, it wasn't even really a baby yet, whatever she says, how could it change everything so much? But what kind of life was it really when you were only alive playing music, but you couldn't ever seem to find the right place to do that, the right people to do it with? Things came too easy for you, his mother had told him in a resigned way a few years back. You were so good at things when you were a little boy. The teachers made so much of you. That's why you never developed any ambition. Right now, he needed to find something, anything to keep himself busy. He wished Johnny were around so he could bum a cigarette off him. Several of them sit and smoke and drink cold beers and talk about bullshit that didn't matter. But he couldn't bear to call him and have to explain this weird, miserable thing. Not right now. Cat's face was so pale, like it was her heart that came out of her, not a little dead baby. He stood up and moved into their bedroom. They had boxes of things stacked there, waiting until he cleared out the spare bedroom, his practice room, as he sometimes called it, although he could count on one hand the times he'd actually spent in there with his guitar. Practice room was going to be the baby's room, and all those things would be the baby's things. Would have been. Now she wouldn't want to see them when she came back. The first few symbolic baby clothes purchases, the books and stuffed toys she had picked up at a garage sale. It doesn't count if you buy it used, she had told him, only half joking. Or maybe not joking at all. It doesn't jinx the baby. But it had. Or something had. Theo felt like he had been the jinx somehow, although he couldn't say why. He was drenched in guilt that he couldn't explain, like a mysterious stain on his clothes. In any case, here he was, and there stood three big grocery store boxes full of things that would make her cry when she got home. He could do something with them. That, that would be something useful he could manage. He could put them in the garage where she wouldn't have to see them right away, wouldn't have to walk in on her first day home and find a cute little stuffed dog looking back at her with button eyes. It wasn't all that easy to find a place for the baby things in the garage where Theo's boxes of secondhand science fiction books and other miscellaneous crap stood in tottering piles like the ruins of an ancient city where unused exercise equipment and unbuilt packaged bookshelves left so little room for Cat's car that once the warm weather came for good, she wouldn't even attempt the difficult task of parking in there again until late autumn, at which point all the new crap that had found its way in during the summer would have to be relocated so the car would fit in the garage again. As he was trying to squeeze the last box onto the narrow shelf above the workbench, it toppled over and caught him a good shot on the temple. When he reached up, he came away with a spot of blood on his finger. The children's books had spilled out onto the steps leading down from the kitchen. Theo's head hurt. 
He lowered himself onto the bottom of the short stairway like a geriatric case, so he wouldn't have to bend as he picked them up from the floor. Old, well-thumbed and clearly loved copies of the Winnie the Pooh stories of Dr. Seuss and Where the Wild Things Are all bought secondhand to fall within Cat's exemption. He picked up his own contribution, one that he'd bought new in a store just because he couldn't imagine raising a baby without it, because even though he never made it up early enough Saturday mornings for Cat's garage sale runs, he had wanted to contribute. Was I the one who jinxed it? In his bleak state, he couldn't even laugh the thought away. He, flipped the book, he flicked the book open. The strange, flat images, crude and almost childish at first glance, caught him up as they always did. Had his mom really read this to him? It seemed impossible to believe now that he'd had a mother who held her, her child in her lap and read him Goodnight Moon. The words were as familiar as a catechism. The little rabbit in his great green room saying goodnight to all the familiar nursery objects, to the mittens and kittens, the comb and the brush, and of course, strangest of all, to nobody. Good night, nobody. He had never understood that. In one way, it was the most magical part of the book, and in another, the most frightening. All the other pictures, the rabbit child in pajamas, the fire, the old lady rabbit reading, all made sense. The catalog of items, chairs, and cats, and socks. Good night, good night. Then just that blank page, and good night, nobody. But who was nobody? It was childhood zen. Sometimes he had thought in his little boy way that he might be the book's nobody, Theo himself, an anonymous presence, that the book knew he was out there watching the bunny get ready for bed, looking into the warm, cozy room from outside as through a window. His mother had contributed to that. Whenever they reached that part of the book, she had always said, Good night, nobody. Say good night and Theo had done so. Perhaps she had only meant for him to say goodnight to the little someone known as nobody, but he had always believed she was calling him nobody, telling him it was his turn to say goodnight now, and so he had dutifully obeyed. In this last winter, since the pregnancy test had come back, Theo had sometimes imagined a little girl sitting on his lap, Cat had been certain from the first that it was a little girl, even though they hadn't had an ultrasound exam yet. Her childish child's head against his chest as they leafed through the book together. In his offhand dreams, he had never quite been able to imagine what she looked like, had pictured only a head of curly soft hair, a warm little body pressed against him. Nobody. She had looked like nobody and that was who she had turned out to be. He flicked through the pages, the drawings with their strange dreamlike perspective. Then at the end, the final little catechism, saying good night to the last things, the stars, the air, and to noises everywhere. That should go on the baby's gravestone, except there would be no stone, no grave, Cat was going to have a DNC, as the doctors so artlessly called it, to remove anything that hadn't already come out. Anything. There would be nothing to bury. Polly, Rose, all the names they had played with, taking their time because, after all, there had been no hurry. Months to wait. And now she wouldn't be any of them. She was nobody. Good night, nobody sitting on the stairs with a box of books on his lap. He cried. Her face was still pale, framed by the straight lines of her uncombed, unstyled, dark red hair. She had told him that the DNC had been all right, not too bad. She had insisted he go back to his delivery job that day, that she didn't need any hand-holding. 
but it looked like something more than just now useless flesh had been scraped out of her. How's the pain? She shrugged. Her skin seemed paper dry as though she had lost some essential vitality. Her mother handed her a cup of ice. Laney was gone, but both of Kat's parents had arrived for a post-operative visit. Earlier, her dad had made chit-chat with Theo in the hall while the nurse helped Kat with the bedpan. Mr. Lillard doing his comradely best in the current air of Circle the Wagons emergency to obscure the fact that he had never been that thrilled with his semi-son-in-law. Theo appreciated the gesture, but Kat's dad and his yachting sweater had never been a real stumbling block anyway. His wife and only daughter treated Tom Lillard as though he were a graceless but acceptably familiar sundial in the middle of a flower bed they were gardening. When Kat had wanted him to approve of Theo, or at least pretend to, she had enlisted her mother's help, and there had been dinners, family outings. He was a figurehead, an aging CEO of his own family, who only showed up for the board meetings and wondered how so much got done without him. Can I talk to Theo for a minute, Mom? Her mother rose and drew her father by the hand to the door. We'll just go down and look at some magazines in the gift shop, she said. I'll bring you back a people. Thanks. When they had left, Kat closed her eyes for a long moment and let her head slump back against the pillow. I... I didn't think it would hurt so much, Theo said. He suddenly wanted her to know that he was grieving too, although other than the tears on the garage stairs, he wasn't completely certain that was true. When you get home, we... Did, did they say we can try again? Was that an insensitive thing to say? Maybe she would think he was talking about sex. I mean, when you're ready inside, too. In your head, I mean. Her eyes came open in her dry, white face, slowly like something in a horror movie. She took a deep breath. I'm not coming home, Theo. Not like that. It's not going to be like, like that. He stared, puzzled, but he could already feel the tide sucking away what he had thought was firm sand beneath his feet. Not, I'm going to stay with my parents for a few weeks. Mom wants to cook for me, you know, fuss over me. Well, that's, that's fine. And when I come back, she sighed, someone bravely picking up a heavy burden. When I come back, I want to live by myself. It felt like the time he had been hit in the back of the head with a pool cue, the innocent victim of a violent argument that he didn't even know had started behind him. For a long, stupid moment after the world exploded, he could only stare. You mean you... you want us to, s to separate? Her mouth was firm, almost pinched shut, but her eyes were suddenly wet. Yes. No. More than that, I think. It's, I think it's time we went our own ways. Own ways? What kind of bullshit is that? She blinked, the sad resolve suddenly agitated by anger. It's not bullshit, Theo. We lost the baby and it, it opened up my eyes. I can see now that the baby was the only reason I was staying with you. To give our child a fighting chance to have two parents who were together, but... And it wouldn't have fixed things between us. I can't believe how stupid I was, like I was under some kind of spell, believing that somehow we would have this rosy little family life. But in real life, you would have been just the same, doing just enough to get by, a, a smile, a joke, oh yeah, lots of cute stuff, but nothing real. Eventually, we would have broken up, and then you'd have been a weekend dad doing the bare minimum, no plan, no organization, no commitment. Take the kid out and buy her an ice cream cone. Drop her back off with me afterward. 
He could only shake his head at this torrent of fury, judged guilty of neglecting a child who didn't even exist. Don't pretend it would be different. The anger had finally brought color back to her bloodless face, coarse little patches of red like sunburn. It's always the same with you. You're a grown man, Theo, but you act like a teenager. Where are you going? Out. When are you coming back? I don't know. I can't believe I was going to have a kid with you. Is this all about me coming back late that night? No, Theo, but it's all about a hundred a thousand other things like that. The shit you start and never finish, your going nowhere job, coming home late smelling like, like the Fillmore West or something, hanging around with your teenage musician friends. You probably got little teenage groupies too. Wow, Theo, do you really like remember the 80s? That's bullshit. His fists were clenched. Bullshit. Maybe. Maybe I'm being unfair. I'm sorry, I've... I just lost a baby, remember? But I've hit the end of the road, and that isn't bullshit. Look, I, I know that I know that women and motherhood is like the sacred thing, but you're not the only goddamn person who lost a baby here, cat. I was going to be a father. She stared at him for a moment without speaking. When I first met you, Theo, she finally said, I thought you were the most amazing man I'd ever known. Beautiful. You really were beautiful. Even my friends agreed on that. And, and you had that voice and that charm. Like you were someone out of a movie with perfect lighting and choreography and, and good writers. You charmed me, all right, but I don't see it anymore. Either it's fading or I just woke up. Anger made him feel like his skin was tight, like he was the Incredible Hulk or something, growing muscles. And he was standing over a woman who'd just gone through a miscarriage, a woman in a hospital bed. He opened his fists, made himself take a deep breath. So, not only are you breaking up with me, you're telling me I'm shit, too. Just, what, is a going away present? A parting gift for the losing player? You thought you should just let me know I'm a big fake and I'm not worth anything. No, Theo. But I am saying that something about you has changed and what's left isn't enough, at least for me. I don't, I don't want to spend the rest of my life hoping that things will get better, that you'll stop being a good-looking, footloose guy with potential and start being a real man. Okay, you saying the way you looked tonight to me on our first date, and I fell for you, but that's, it's not enough to last a lifetime. I don't know why I couldn't see that until the miscarriage, but I sure see it now. I'd rather be single. I'd rather have a baby by myself if I can even get pregnant again. So why don't you take the time while I'm at my parents and get your stuff and find an apartment or something? You're throwing me out of my own house? I pay half the rent. Barely. But it was my house first anyway, remember? I only let you move in because Lainey was getting a place with Brian and it was easier than putting an ad in the paper. He stood full of diffuse rage and with a hole in the center of him that seemed like it could never be filled. Is that all it was, huh? Easier than putting in an ad. It took a moment, but her expression softened. No, that wasn't all it was. Of course not. I loved you, Theo. Loved. He closed his eyes. Everything had just liquefied and swirled away from him, his entire life gurgling down the drain. I, I probably still love you, if that's what you're asking, but I can't live with you anymore. It's too much work trying to believe in us. I'm too old for fairy tales. When he passed her parents in the hallway, their embarrassed expression showing that they knew damn well what their daughter had just told him, he wanted to say something cutting to them, something bitter and clever, but he was too empty, too angry, too sad. The only thing he could think of was, it's not fair, 
and that was not the kind of thing 30-year-old men were supposed to say. And that's where we'll stop tonight, at the end of chapter one. So we ran a little bit over, so I forgot there was that extra little bit at the end. I was thinking I was going to end just before three, but there was an extra little cola, coda at the end there I'd forgotten about. Because again, it's been a long time since I wrote this. Um, and But that's basically what I wanted to say to you was, going to be reading again tomorrow at 7 p.m. my time, Pacific Standard Time, Ilva. Thank you for pointing out to me. Pacific Standard Time, no longer Pacific Daylight Time. 7 p.m. tomorrow, Pacific Standard Time. I will be continuing with Chapter 2. Anyway, um, sorry, I see some people saying stream is pretty jumpy today. I, I'm not seeing that on my end, so I apologize. That sounds like that may be a Facebook problem or maybe a Chrome problem, um, but I because I hadn't seen any changes on my end. My apologies for that. Um, anyway, so with that, I just wanted to say thank you all for joining me. It's a great pleasure. Um, we'll be reading this one for a while. So as I mentioned, if anybody wants to check any parts they miss, you can find them either on tadwilliams.com or uh, my social media on Facebook and Twitter, um, also on YouTube, thanks to one of our very kind listeners. And um, again, take good care of yourselves, take good care of your loved ones and those around you, and I will see you all very soon. So thank you so much, and come back. I need you. Good night from our house. <laughs>